I mean, there was one part missing actually in Tejal's, um, for Tejal's five parts, and we cut the fourth part short, and the last part would have lasted for another 26 minutes, but we decided to cut that shorter. And um, yes, I hope she will talk a little bit about that last part because that's the actual part where text is in. Um, I want to introduce uh, the person that I haven't introduced yet, which is Nina Tabasomi. And she's the director of the gallery at Taxis Bali, which is called actually Taxis Bali Kunsthalle Tirol. Uh, in Innsbruck, from 2013 to 2015, she served as a curator at the Friderizianum in Kassel, where she was responsible for the ex exhibition program in the Museum Tower. And from 2011 to 2013, she worked as a project manager at KW Kunstwerke Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin. And yes, you have conceived now a number of exhibitions in Tirol, and one of it was Öko Kino, Eco Cinema, that ran from August to November this year. And I would like to start with Eco Cinema. Can you talk a little bit about the concept, how it was shaped, and, and what were your ideas when you thought about doing this kind of very unusual exhibition, I think? Yes, so uh, thanks first of all for the invitation to Christiane and uh, Claudia. And I'm also very honored to be uh, with two admired artists here. Um, so the idea for the Öko Kino or Eco Cinema um, came like from two points. One was that I, a bit like Tejal said in her introduction, I also am at the moment rather interested in um, finding an approach which could also find just a, another way of thinking, not inventing a new one, but maybe just propose other linkages and uh, being critical in this, but finding also some, I would not say affirmative, but you called it loving or like, yeah, or I call it responsive <laughs> modes of uh, discussing um, yeah, our current state. And actually, there are a lot of artistic propositions like uh, that we have seen here also um, that propose another way of linking the human and the non-human. So I was interested in this and then I thought, what uh, would it mean to curate this also intersectionally? And then intersectionally, in this case, I uh, interpreted very literally as, okay, I, in this exhibition, I don't want to show just artistic positions, but I want to also show um, uh, conferences, uh, conference interventions by activists, uh, TV documentaries, uh, also mainstream films which deal uh, with this topic. So, and of course this idea, so then it was clear it must be a film exhibition <laughs> because um, there are not many sculptures by uh, these persons. So then I said, okay, we do a cinema. Uh, and uh, yeah, and of course this was also a reaction to uh, the fact that if you are running such an institution, you are constantly asked, like, what can uh, art do in, uh, in these big questions? Do we really need it? Is it effective? And then I, it was an invitation also to our public to just see how the different forms of activism, like artistic activism, or uh, activism on a, a stage where you have seven minutes to focus on the... Uh, on the most strategic points uh, that could catch attention. Yeah, it was the idea that you come, the visitors could compare this. And then, uh, so I will finish <laughs> soon. The second question then for me was, of course, is um, uh, how can one do this also self-reflexively? Or I thought, how can I, maybe this exhibition could be also a possibility to experiment how we work at the uh, Kunsthalle 
when we, because I like uh, a lot of video art, so I'm showing a lot of videos, and then you always have uh, the problem how you s soundproof the spaces because we don't have this uh, cinema architecture. And then I thought this exhibition could also be a moment where we test like different uh, materials uh, that are more sustainable. So we worked with hay and sheep wool and uh, I forgot to look up how this is called in English. Dinkelspelzen, you know how this is called in English? Spelt something. Spelt, yeah. So grain, something like grain. And um, so we, in every, uh, we had four movie theaters of you. We transformed the spaces and this with these materials. And uh, it was very interesting because some people reacted very aggressive lead to this as uh, like not very aggressively but they they had the feeling that this is uh, now saying uh, you cannot use a carpet or we are the better persons or something but this was not really um, the goal of it it was uh, <laughs> it was just the idea that with these film materials we could tested and then actually I had to find out that I cannot use it these things in another exhibition because we are not used like a carpet even a carpet smells a lot no a new carpet in an exhibition space but we are so used to uh, to smell this that we won't connect it to the work if you use um, like the sheep pool was quite good it's just very uh, time intense to fix it at the wall <laughs> Uh, but all the other materials are way too telling. They, you cannot, uh, not now, maybe in some years. So this was also somehow interesting. But uh, you mean that they were also too connotated with something? or To what? To, that there were too many connotations with them as well? Or Yeah, I think it's just we are not used to have this. Uh, uh, it's immediately like... Um, you, we are used to read this as an installation then and not as something very functional. And they were all, like to me it was very important that these are all functional, that, that they are not extending the films in the space. Yeah, And I think with these films it somehow still worked because so with the fact that there were many films in each room in each movie uh, theater, uh, people were aware that this is not like uh, the mirroring of the film. Uh, and it had to do with this topic, so somehow it worked, but I cannot use it, for example, in my current exhibition, which is about lachen, laughing, then it's just not possible. Um. What is interesting for me, and unfortunately I haven't seen it, but it sounds as if you also created like this multi-sensory experience through the materials. And I think that's really interesting because this is, this is one, of the, um, one of the problems about cinema or kind of something that is always criticized, that there, is no, there seems to be no multi-sensory cinema that is kind of the, the gaze is basically the privileged sense and the others are not that involved. I mean, by now we know that this is not exactly true, but this is, I think, one of the more um, placative, I don't know, more, more foregrounded um, problematics about it. So I think that is really interesting that you created this different space. And also I wanted to ask you a little bit about the four spaces because there seemed to be a dramaturgy to them um, that deals with various topics. So maybe you can talk about that, how you designed this too. Yes, yeah, so the first uh, space was uh, where you enter was called uh, the opening credits. And there were three very short films. Um, so one was um, by Nikolaus Ganstera and Khadija uh, von Zinburg Carroll. Um, and it showed like it made the uh, like the heat, uh, the wind, uh, and other non-human um, uh, elements, agents, uh, the protagonist of the film in a former ice factory in Sharjah. And uh, the 
other one was uh, Greta Thunberg. So a very big contrast between the two and a local uh, or national <laughs> figure of Austria, which yeah, it's a bit on a different level than um, like radius uh, than Greta Thunberg, but I think uh, the same kind of, she had a big impact. She's called Lucia Steinwender and uh, she entered the stage, maybe you remember, uh, last year on the R20 Austrian Summit and uh, took the mic from uh, Chancellor Sebastian Kurz uh, to criticize his politics. So I thought it's quite amazing. And somehow I thought, so Greta Thunberg, everybody knows the summer. She was representing this current like uh, debate or also a new generation. Then, But also I wanted to have this local figure and the artistic film where you had already a clash, then there were the propositions in the second uh, film was uh, films by uh, Annie Sprinkle as Bess Stevens, so the one that we also showed <laughs> together, and the, uh, also Good by Gawley Mountains and Water Makes Us Wet. There was a Donna Haraway uh, story, how is it called again, from uh, Fabrizio Terranova, um, storytelling for an earthly survival, um, uh, where you yeah, have a really intimate meeting with Donna Haraway. And uh, The Biggest Little Farm, which is rather, uh, yeah, it's a film which was running in normal cinemas. Um, but they all had in common that they make uh, propositions how to just fundamentally change the, uh, pro or the, the discussion that we have at the moment in the media, what we like, or let's say in the West, how we discuss this topic. So to change just our thinking mode and thereby then also have the possibility to enjoy uh, the feeling that we are part of a bigger uh, a system and that we are not here to dominate it. Without saying this, you are not allowed to do this anymore and this. This was also a, a reason for me to do this exhibition that I thought somehow this, like you cannot really, uh, we cannot uh, come forward with uh, uh, saying this is forbidden, this is forbidden, this is forbidden. Like we can also do it a bit more pleasurable in highlighting just like the linkage. And then there were the precursors. So, for example, I think I should not mention all the films because it will be too long. Rachel, Ka a documentary on Rachel uh, Carson, who is some eco-feminist avant la lettre, who wrote in uh, 1962 a book called Silent Spring. She was a biologist and she started a big uh, debate in the... Uh, U.S. about uh, controversy about uh, if pesticides are uh, really hurting animals, plants, and human beings. And uh, this is just like she was really an amazing woman who wrote this. This book became a bestseller and uh, it prevented also uh, there was one pesticide taken from the market after this uh, as a result from this book. And there was a film by Adam Curtis uh, who questions like the relation uh, or our idea about a uh, self-stabilizing ecosystem and he says it's a wrong idea, it's a machine fantasy which was, was projected uh, on uh, nature. And um, then uh, Greta Gard, uh, eco uh, feminism now, uh, where she shot at a conference which took place in 1996 in Vermont, uh, like very prominent uh, uh, eco feminists, also with different angles and different positions, like Vandana Shiva or Vainona Laduke, and uh, many more. And then in the last space, w uh, which I called um, Practices. There were um, just artistic positions like Mava Asanyas, um, who worked also on Rojava. <laughs> so she also you were, you you were there together exactly. One could read it in the 
credits also, um, and who showed in this film, so she was concentrating on this guerrilla uh, women's movement and showing uh, that uh, collaborating also with nature and being responsive to it um, is uh, also a necessity by if you are in too many struggles uh, at once. And it's not... So in this space, in general, it was about, like, we don't have to invent everything anew. It's very wrong. We, there is a lot of knowledge, maybe here... Uh, it's not so present, but we can uh, really go, there is a lot. We just have to change maybe the, the gaze and to look in other regions. And there were, uh, the other film was by Kirsti Petterstadt, uh, as a farmer on, in, in Catalonia. And um, was, was also is very impressive. And uh, Rosalind Nashashibi's uh, documenta work on Elisabeth Wild and Vivian Suter, two uh, Austrian artists who live in Guatemala in a, a garden and the complexities also if you want to change things and if you, they live with indigenous people but then there's also a complicated colonial situation and it also showed how all these things are interconnected. Thank you, Nina. I mean, I understand this conversation is something that we can open to the public as well. We have a microphone here in the audience. So if you have spontaneous questions, please raise your hands. If not, then I start with a couple of questions. <laughs> and But yeah, please raise your hand as soon as you have a question. Um, yeah, thank you, Nina. I think that you already mentioned it that uh, one of the questions about modeling concepts of care and empathy, but also how we can define a, a sensual, responsive relationship with our planet is, is for me something that exactly transfers to, to Tejal's work and uh, to this um, human animals, to these beings that are completely undefined, whether they are alien beings, whether they are a mixture between uh, kind of a, a robot and a human or an, and an animal as well, whether they come from the future, whether they are located in the present or in the past. And they have this polyamorous relationship to each other and all the surrounding creatures and environments. And um, yeah, I think so. This is a really beautiful, um, yeah, kind of, not coincidence, but this is kind of beautiful that you formulate this question that then is uh, conceptualized to put in images in, in your work. So the, the starting question for me that I would like to ask Angela as well as, as Tejal would be, um, how do you start, on the one hand as a researcher, on the other hand as an activist, to put your ideas into images? I mean, it's a basic question, but I think it's, a, on the other hand, a very complicated question because you presented a little bit about your research, you talked about your research, but how do you then put it from basically researching into, into a, a different practice? And I would like to start with Tejal in this case and then hand it over to Angela. Would you... You, dif <laughs> you don't want to... <laughs> Um, I don't know, it can, like either of you. I can start. I mean, I think Tejal and I both have a bit different practices, obviously. I mean, much of what I'm shooting is not staged necessarily. Um, <clears throat> how I transform it into images. Oh, I mean, for me, my camera is like a, it's a capture device, right? So I'm filming things that I am drawn to or I'm um, <laughs> horrified by or that I feel like need to be seen. Um, it's a difficult question, actually. It's quite intuitive, I guess, like um, a lot of editing in a, like a documentary project like this. I don't know if that satisfies your question. Yeah, I was, yeah, maybe, we, or do you want to answer, like, yeah, okay. Thank you. 
So uh, for me, very often, um, the starting of the work is text-based. I'm very inspired by text. So there'll be some piece of text that I come across which becomes kind of like an aha moment. And then the imagery just kind of, you know, follows through. In this uh, particular case, in this project, I mean, my work was moving towards, you know, wanting to address this question of interspecies. Uh, the the hook was that, uh, I mean, you know, I was invited for the documenta, and this is a project that was commissioned. I mean, this is what I proposed for that. What I found interesting was that um, I think, uh, uh, gosh, I'm gonna, I have such a memory uh, blip, but um, Re Rebecca Horn was invited in, um, I think 1962 or something for her first documenta. Actually, it was exactly 40 years before my invitation. And um, I'm always interested in playing with this history and who makes history and how it's made. So this, I mean, this work of Rebecca Horn, the Ein Horn, had always kind of stayed in my mind, also because she uh, uh, references to Frida Kahlo the broken column to arrive at her work. So there's a kind of a chain of events that are happening. So uh, the, the initial landscape you see is actually a salt desert and uh, it's a region actually from where I trace my hereditary, but it's also a site of the Harappa and Mohenjo-daro excavations and uh, the, the most oldest seal of a single horned animal comes from there. So in terms of imagery, how the interspecies moved into imagery, it was this hook of all these events kind of coming together. But what, uh, why is it in both your works? Because I think it's also very crucial <laughs> to them. Uh, like, why do you, why is it so important to have the several screens, like the multi-channel? I think, um, <clears throat> for me, it's in, it depends on the piece, but for this and for other works, it's a way of viewing, uh, viewing the situation, you know, and it's about in between the images and how we perceive things. So for me, in this work, it was in, it was important that there was three screens, actually two screens. It was not the original plan, but so that people were constantly shifting the attention and there's things that happen within the movement of the of space, not only with the progression of of time or images. So that was actually um, what was important to me. And uh, for me, actually, I find it very difficult to tell linear stories because I, I just, I, I find it extremely difficult to work with a single screen because I feel that the stories are so complex and there is so much which, like the whole is always greater than the sum of the parts. So there's so much that has to reveal itself through the conjunction of this multi, sensorial multi-screen input. So if I have the resources, I would always somehow prefer to work with multi-channel. Maybe it's just easier for me, maybe, yeah. I mean, I'm, I would like to ask Angela about what you just said about movement and movement in, in, in time, basically. And what was striking for me in seeing that on the, on the one hand it worked as a two-channel, projection. I mean, I, I never had problems to think about myself in the actual, or to, to trying thinking about myself in the free channel video installation. With Teixal's work, I was constantly thinking, okay, how would this now look like? How would this look like if I have something behind me and this here and this here? So I really tried to imagine it in space, which is kind of impossible, but still I tried. And in your case, I think it was because there was really ref like the editing was was very beautiful i think in terms of how you connected um sound especially and then also there are these long passages of driving where you drive through the landscape and this is also kind of 
this constant moving, this uh, kind of very very fluid experience of time, of time and space. And I think that also transferred between these two channels a lot. And so I think it, it to a certain extent it really made sense to to do it in in a in a two channel version. And yeah, and um, I also wanted to ask you if that, uh, coming back to the question about artistic or artistic research to a certain extent, and then uh, how to put this in image and, and thinking about representation, because I think in both works it's about questions of representation, of how you present something that haven't or that hasn't been thought until now, and in 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 terms of. Um, the ungraspable catastrophe that we are in the midst, probably. How do you represent the unrepresentable, basically? This this old question that we have in, in every kind of artistic practice. And um, yeah, was there a lot that you knew you were kind of looking for these images when you kind of looked for these spaces and these places, especially in the landscapes? Or was there a lot that you were shooting when being there, trying to discover something, or and, and doing a lot in the editing at the at the end? Yeah. Yeah, I mean the film is made mostly in the editing, right? I mean, but uh, as I was there, I was filming constantly because, um, especially I mean, in both places, but in North Dakota, it was so incredibly shocking, and I just I felt like. I have to capture this everything somehow because it's just, it's too overwhelming, right? Um, um, yeah. Yeah. That thing is coming. It, it's coming. Thank you. Um, so that is a question for Angela, for Angie. Um, I wonder about two um, things. One thing is the decision you're taking when you edit um, images of destruction of the planet, of nature, of Earth, um, that at the same time um, are very aesthetic, they're very beautiful. So we are, as viewers, constantly drawn between, I'd, I'd say, repulsion and attraction because um, there is a big ambivalence. And I wonder how you deal with that in the in the editing and, and development process. The, and the other question I'd have is a very simple one. I think it, it'd be uh, maybe also important to address the people you were showing in your work. And also, I'm wondering what happened to the Rojava community meanwhile, because you were there in August, and um, what happened in between wasn't foreseeable at that point in time. <coughs> Yeah, or about the aesthetization of images. It is, of course, um, at the same time, they're very cinematic, right? Uh, suddenly, when you're filming something like a gas flare, it can be very beautiful, even though, actually, if you're actually there, it's, you realize it's incredibly hot, it's very loud, it's very... Um, it's not a nice situation. So it's, the, it's kind of ironic. Um, the images might look beautiful, but the actual feeling on the ground there is the complete opposite. So... Um, how to and how to transfer this into images? I mean, fracking is a bit difficult because a lot of the pollution is not so obvious, I guess, or some of the impacts are not so obvious. So I guess it comes more from the kind of create a ominous environment, or maybe to take what people are are saying, you know, the very strong moments of like emotion, I guess. Um, not necessarily the facts, right? I mean, I have tons of facts about fracking, but I didn't find those to be the most, um, let's say, convey the most urgency. Um, in terms of the people in Rojava, yeah, this is, um, I was there last year in August, and um, they, I'm following what they're posting on Facebook. They, everyone seems to be okay who live there. Actually, when I was there, the village was not yet open. This is like a prototype um, that they were creating, which they would have gone on to make more of had now the entire project suddenly come to, you know, like a standstill and is in a state of emergency because of, of Erdogan's movements and the, his Syrian allies. 
Um, people had to leave when the bombing was happening initially, and apparently they've gone back, but it's very close to the Turkish border, so it's within this sort of whatever buffer zone, safe zone. It's actually just a zone of destruction. Um, so it seems to be uh, kind of unclear what's going to happen next. Um, Are there more questions? But then I, I think I'm, I will continue with questions. Um, yeah, another one kind of concerns scale. I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in the question of scale in both works because I think that when we talk about uh, yeah, the, the state the planet is in, then we're always talking about this uh, ungraspable scale, what I said before. And um, so there is this there's this beautiful quote, I think it's by Guattari, by Felix Guattari in Angela's work, um, that we, the crisis on a global scale needs an authentic political, social and cultural revolution, but one that is not only concerned with the visibility and forces on a large scale, but also on, a, on the molecular domains of sensibility, intelligence and desire. And I was looking for that basically in both works because I think it comes up in both works, this question of scale of how um, we can deal with this also on a molecular level. And there are some images that draw my attention to that in, in terms of bird's eye perspective where you never know if it's like a, a microscopic view of something or if it's a macro basically um, shot or the, the even the, the first image in, in Tejal's work in the first channel where you have this entity behind the camera where it's not clear which, which subject is that, whose gaze is it, and it's just walking through that material that could be sand, that could be an artificial material, that could be, I mean, that actually is salt, as you explained it. So there's always this kind of um, oscillating between different scales, between different forms of the gaze. I don't know, can you say something about that a little bit? Was that something you had in mind as well? Um, I, I feel that when we look very deeply at what's happening at the intimate, uh, personal, local, but look very deeply, we can see that um, you know, very similar processes are also at work uh, at a planetary scale also. I mean, I'll speak about this more tomorrow, but you know, the, the fact that everything is interdependent and that interdependency works within how our mind, our heart, our emotions work and also how all the planetary events work. So I feel that it's, it's very good, you know, this expansion of going in and coming out. And, and I, I found it, you know, it's, it's very beautiful also how you move from the interviews to all these landscapes. You keep coming back again and again between this movement of, you know, yeah, so. Isn't it also that you don't really dom like that you refuse a bit to dominate the material completely? Like if you, because you said a documentary, but if you, of course, it's an artistic documentary, I would say in many regards, and maybe this is one of it. Yeah, yeah I think it's <laughs> it's imp it's imp it's important to have these m moments. Like you say, like the the micro, and um, this is actually this kind of a, a like a sensual connection, which is that which is being not only it's not being lost, it's being taken away. People are not allowed to have it. This is one of the things that, for example, there in North Dakota, um, uh, really was became really obvious to me, and what people said to me is that we have no we have no privacy anymore. You know, we, can, we can't go out and we can't go collect berries. We can't go out and we can't go, you know, uh, have, say, our prayers because everywhere here is just industrialized. And I think this is, 
and you're not even allowed to think, oh, I, I love this thing, you know? Like, that is a, a un, that doesn't have value in, in a capitalist economy. And I think this is, I mean, if we don't manage to escape this, to get out of this, and have a different kind of relation with everything, it doesn't mean we can't have technology and things like this, it just means they need to be produced in a different way where a a monetary profit is not the the a driving factor because th that's going to just it's leading us i had to just think when we were watching the very long i was thinking i had a long time to contemplate combustion <laughs> at the end and just thinking about like yeah the cycle of combustion you know and technically producing carbon monoxide which would feed the trees but of course, we're cutting all the trees down <laughs> and this sort of like out of control um, yeah, feedback loop that we're, we're going into, which is exactly out of balance because there's, you know, ecosystems, they don't necessarily balance themselves out. They can just go some other direction. Anyways, yeah. Are there more questions from the audience? No, we have a microphone. Raise your <laughs> it's it's over there. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. I have a question for Nina. Um, so tell us the results of your uh, acoustic experiments with natural materials. So as I said, the the sheep wool, I really liked it, um, and somehow in the beginning it smelled, but. I think if you would use it in another context, people could, maybe they would not recognize immediately like what. And uh, it was very effective also. So it really worked. But to, in order to put it at the on the wall, it was already in the installation um, hardcore, like two people a whole week. And this was just the beginning because for <laughs> dismantling, it was even more complicated. So one would have to <laughs> change the way to fix it. Uh, but this I found very good. Then we also w worked with cardboard. This I will, um, I will keep in this exhibition. But this is also not like it's not, it's not hay. And hay I found also was uh, worked somehow. But of course you exclude everyone who has a hay allergy. And I found it interesting because you said that uh, this uh, smell and sensual dimension, I was not really not thinking of it. Um, it just came then very heavily <laughs> with these materials. And people, it was interesting to see how affected people are by this. So there were a lot of people who would say, oh my God, I want to stay the whole day in this hay room. And, uh, and others who got a claustrophobic attacks in the same room. So the, uh, somehow the, how these materials would, uh, how people reacted to these different materials were very diff different. But I think, yeah, most of them, um, they worked all acoustically well. But, yeah, as I said, I'm not so sure if one can use this in another context. We would still have to use a bit. And I really think that every, I mean, we are used to soundproofing material, but we are also used to the uh, smell of it, to the look of it, and we don't read it as part of the work. And this is not the uh, case yet for these other materials. Mm. But I think, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, sorry, there was a question, sure. <coughs> the microphone, we're taping it, that's why. Well, I, was just, I was just wondering, um, the usual soundproof material you use, is that reusable or is that, would you like install it and then tear it down and chuck it? Or how does that work? Some of them you have to, uh, they become just garbage. And... Uh, of course, a very not so expensive uh, thing that I very often use is carpet. But then, if you discuss with the artist which carpet do we choose, I cannot use it. I would not use it for another exhibition because then it's linked to this work, and the artist could 
you also need a lot of storage space to uh, to have it, or you cannot ship it there. So, in the end, I mean now, for example, because I have the uh, actual the current problem that uh, I will open my next exhibition in, in four days, and now. Uh, how can I use carpet? <laughs> I don't want to. So what I did now, for example, I'm reusing a carpet which is kind of has a strong color and was I, I did not want to throw it away because I thought maybe there will be something. And then I just changed, like I, I used a lot of things that we used before. I just connected them differently and yeah. And the... The new artist liked it, this proposition, so we will do this, but it's not it's not easy. I mean you you both know this too, no? It's complicated. Mm. I think I turned mine off accidentally. Oh. Tejo, I wanted to ask you, I was a little bit um you're thinking about because in a lot of the scenes, of course, there's a lot of errant plastic, let's say, like the trash. And in the last, in the underwater scenes, I started to think, maybe this is what we need to do with all the plastic trash. We just need to collect it and turn it into something beautiful and have it around everywhere and like fill the world with these plastic sculptures. <laughs> and so I'm just wondering what, like when you were thinking about the film and your locations and the costumes and how it all comes together, I just was wondering if you could say something about that. Um, actually, it's very interesting because this is my first uh, work which went so all out into the landscape. Because before this work, I would always try to stay in and use very uh, non uh, spaces you cannot identify, you know, just very vague kind of spaces. But anyway, um, so I was, I was totally obsessed with the garbage we were producing. I was completely like, I mean, I don't know, in India it's very, very visible. It's not something that, you know, is cleaned and put up. I mean, it is a little bit, but it's just overflowing everywhere, everywhere. So I just really wanted to work as much as possible with trash. And I was also interested in trash and queer aesthetics. And um, so, you know, it was just um, the, the choral, when I was watching, the, I mean, chorals for me. <laughs> but I was really thinking, it's really, it was really interesting how this very inorganic material is introduced into an inorganic swimming pool <laughs> and then seamlessly intercut with the ocean and then you're always going back and forth. Um, but it was really a question in my mind that I find it quite amazing that all the inorganic material that we have managed to make is all coming from what is available on this earth. You know, it's not like so it's, in a way, it, it has an organic basis, but somehow our intentions have converted it into completely poisonous, toxic matter. So it was this line between this, you know, organic, inorganic, artificial, real, this always, you know, straddling this in between the, the waves of all these things. So I spent a lot of time working on the, um, a lot meaning it was extremely enjoyable in a way because it was like, you know, you're just like a little kid and your friends come and then you're like, this is what I found at the trash shop. <laughs> and then, you know, you are just busy, you know, spending hours and whatever. And um, I actually quite got attached to those corals. <laughs> I had them hanging in my studio for a really long time. And for the, the, the second channel, which takes place in a landfill, those costumes uh, and all the accessories were actually made by a, a, a fashion designer, so to speak, but who works with always recycled material. That's her speciality, that she, you know, in particular works with that, so, yeah. Yeah, there's a question here. 
Yeah, I would like to know from both of you, Angela and uh, Dijal, you both declare yourself as activists, I mean artists and activists, and also is, is how you feel uh, uh, about your uh, local Friday for Future movements, and especially you, Angela, if you encountered other activists in your research, and what, uh, how was the exchange, and what are they doing? And Dijal, I would also like to know from you this, this Friday for Future movement, if this is something that is big in New Delhi, if it exists, and how you relate to this. Hmm. I have a fraught relationship to this word to term activist and artist and kind of compartmentalize these things because actually I see our, our behavior as kind of on a spectrum. And so I, I don't know, I, I tend, I, I think we need to get rid of this word activist actually um, and complexify a little bit. So I met a lot of people doing a lot of um, amazing and important things uh, on, on different levels. Um, not everyone agreed with each other. Um, there were a lot of uh, tensions between people also at the same time. Conflicting strategies in both locations. Um, yeah, but I think uh, right now I think it's really important that we have a conversation about uh, uh, ethical positions and how, how are we going to to stop the horrors that are happening. Um, yeah, and I think absolutely like the title of my film, we need to end patriarchy and we need to stop producing these individuals who have no access to their uh, effective sides. Um, yeah, so that's just an aside. Um. So I'm not an active activist anymore. I am very much an activist, but I'm just not, I would not fit the category of a active activist. So I, wouldn't, I don't want to claim that space because I, you know. Um, and I, I always thought of myself as an artivist, you know, even when I, when I was actively an activist, I was doing a lot of cultural activism. And Arundhati Roy had an amazing, she made a very uh, funny statement, which I love, because when people would keep asking, are you an artist? Are you an activist? And she said, you know, I feel like a sofa come bed. <laughs> you know, you're neither a sofa nor a bed. You're this kind of in between. Um, there is a lot of stuff happening in New Delhi as far as whether ecology or environment is concerned or we have a lot of pressing issues going on in India right now. I mean, we have an extremely right-wing government. Kashmir has been under clampdown. There have been massive uh, student protests. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I mean, everywhere you see people are rising up and they're being pushed down by weapons and machines and, media blackouts and whatnot, but people are fighting, yeah. But don't you think that the, uh, I would also agree that these uh, distinctions are difficult, but at the same time, I think uh, I'm very often not so happy with uh, exhibitions where then everything is so topic focused and then a work seems to be political because of its topic, and sometimes I wonder, yeah, but, so why, then I can also just read an article, like what's the, what is, is added here, and what I always think that maybe in an activist situation, like where you have to produce attention, you have to be just very strategic, no? Like it's not about complexity, it's how you, can manage to bring to move things forward in a certain position, and you have to pretend that you have the solution in some regards. And I think uh, what I would define then rather as artistic activism is that you can 
uh, show complexity, you can also show ambivalency, like uh, the question about the ambivalency and how you show these images. You, you can do all this in an art and you cannot do it when you have to convince immediately people so, and maybe also the questions are more fundamental no like how can we it's not about like first second third uh, we need this i mean i just think we need both <laughs> and the intersection no i don't think they're mutually exclusive these two things mm -hmm. i don't think they're mutually exclusive no they should be multiplied actually both yeah, yeah. Yeah, but for me, that's also what I said before, that's, or, or what is actually the, the quote by Felix Cotteri, that, that this is also like the large scale and the molecular level, yeah. because I think that, that these are, for me at least, and I'm talking from a very subjective position now, these are like the most inspiring artworks that work on both levels, and on the molecular and also on a larger scale, and that keep these ambivalences that, that you said, yeah. Are there more questions about both practices? Yes, there's one over there. I would like to ask you both, uh, how is the cooperation with the people who are working on the film? Is there any special uh, way how you work with, with uh, your colleagues? Uh, it varies from project to project. This particular project, it's a miracle to even execute it in India. So it's really through the kinship network of friends and well-wishers and um, some amazing chance encounters because even to imagine editing this work or doing sound design on this work where I have to sit with a sound designer for like three months or two months you know, going micromillimeter by micromillimeter, like as the vagina is being shown full screen. And, you know, my sound designer might be a very straight and conservative person. So um, it's really, this project is just totally networks of friendship and some good karma <laughs> ripening, yeah. I, I try also to then, um, because they were friends, there was not necessarily a monetary exchange, but for example, um, at the opening of the project in Documenta, I invited the other main protagonist to come and join. And uh, she's actually a writer and a performer, and you didn't get to see the last channel, the fifth channel of the work, um, which uh, has poems that she has written that you know kind of were commissioned to her. But most in importantly, it's the conversations that we had and the experiences we shared because they're also artists. A lot of the people, they're either curators or writers or, so it's uh, feeding mutually our practices. Yeah, I know for myself, um, uh, which comes out of the earlier project in Greece, um, like for, for example in North Dakota and also in Rojava, when after I'm shooting I gave a, like in North, North Dakota a, f a hard drive with all the interviews in and the footage in to uh, one of the women who kind of acted as my producer there, kind of out of the blue. Um, so it's, it's not just like I want to go in there and, and take something, you know what I mean? And also in North Dakota, I have to say that every interview I did, at some point, I asked myself, am I making a film right now or am I a psychoanalyst? <laughs> because the interviews somehow became like these long sessions and somehow I have like three hours of material and then we were talking about something completely other, <laughs> like what's going on? So I think in, in this sense, I, I, I didn't approach it as like someone just going to take and leave and say bye, you know, uh, not at all. Also in Rojava, I left like all of my footage as much as I could copy onto their hard drives them, uh, for them. Any more questions? Because if not, then I would suggest that we open it up. We 
kind of we have drinks I think at the bar on the other side of the foyer and I hope you join us and I don't know for more talks and for some drinks thank you for coming thank you Tejal Nina and Angela